In this video, I'll show you how you can create your very own ZK EVM layer 2 blockchain built on top of an Ethereum testnet. This video will be split into two parts. The first part will be conceptual understandings of how a layer 2 blockchain is built. And the second part will be actually building out each of the components of a layer 2 blockchain and running them inside of Docker containers. By the end of the video, if you follow along, you'll have an understanding of exactly how layer 2 blockchains work and you'll have a fully functional L2 chain running on your local machine deployed to Ethereum's Sepolia testnet. The video will have timestamps in the description for you to skip through any of the sections that you don't want to watch and we'll also have a link to the Discord to help you progress to the end of the process. With that said, let's get right into the first section. So to start us off, before we actually go into kickstarting our own layer 2 blockchain and diving into the code of things, I wanted to include a couple of sections of fundamentals and conceptual overviews of, okay, what are we actually building here? What is a layer two? What does a CDK allow you to do? And the different kinds of varieties of layer twos and customizations that you can make and the fundamental understandings of the architecture of a layer two blockchain that you're actually going to create. All right, so to begin with, we're actually gonna overview what is a layer two blockchain? And we're just gonna spend one or two minutes on this because I kind of assume if you're wanting to build your own layer two, then you already have some idea of how a layer two works. But if you don't, no worries, we're gonna cover that in this section here. So layer two blockchains, just like Ethereum, create blocks and chain them together. So I'm not gonna go through the basic, basic fundamentals of how blockchains work, but layer two is very similar to Ethereum where they create blocks. Those blocks have multiple transactions in them. Usually they don't have to have transactions in them, but typically they have multiple transactions in each block. Each block is then connected to the previous block with a block hash as Ethereum is. So the concepts of a layer two blockchain compared to Ethereum are very, very similar. So you don't have to learn too much here, but each block in a layer two blockchain is kind of compressed or batched together to be stuck into a layer one blockchain to achieve that scalability, which is the goal of layer two blockchain. So each block, let's say this block has two transactions, this block has three transactions, this block might have a thousand transactions, this block might have zero transactions. It doesn't really matter the actual numbers. The point is we're processing these transactions effectively, we're processing them with low gas fees for our users and fast transaction times. That is kind of the whole point of layer two blockchains is to achieve higher levels of scalability than is possible on the Ethereum layer one chain and provide a better experience for the users of that chain. What happens behind the scenes is the transactions across multiple blocks, let's include all of them, for example, get included into a batch. And we'll talk about the how those batches get created behind the scenes in, in another one of these conceptual overviews here. But essentially, they all get batched together. So two transactions from one block, three from the next, a thousand from the next, zero from the next, et cetera, et cetera, all get included into a batch. And that batch is sent as a transaction to Ethereum. So we can send that transaction or as we'll talk about in one of the next overview sections, what type of data gets sent in different types of L2s. But essentially you're sending some information to Ethereum batched together all of the information about these transactions and providing it into a single transaction on Ethereum. And Ethereum is going to, again, depending on what type of data you're sending and what type of layer two you're building. In our case, we're using uh, zero knowledge proofs to verify the validity of that batch. And we'll talk again in more detail of how that happens under the hood. But essentially, we have now processed 1,005 or however many transactions in this example. On the layer two, we've taken away that computational load from Ethereum and we have executed it at the layer two level. And behind the scenes, we're posting that information back down to Ethereum inside of one single transaction. And that is going to be included in an Ethereum block. And Ethereum will process all of the L1 transactions as well as our layer two batch transaction as it does normally. There's no change really required at the layer one level. Okay, so the basics are very familiar with you if you've ever read any of the Ethereum docs or done some research into how Ethereum and our blockchains in general work. So there's not a lot of fundamental changes into how it looks and feels from a user and a developer perspective. And that's that's kind of the whole point is that this 
is designed to be extremely similar, if not in some cases identical experience to developing and using Ethereum chains. So let's zoom in into each of these layers a little bit and talk about the architectural overview of layer two chains and their relationship to layer one. So let's introduce us here as our little user and how we submit transactions to the layer two is actually identical to the process of submitting transactions to the layer one. So we're going to directly submit transactions to this layer two here. Let's just leave this as like a blank black box for now. And this is going to go through an RPC. So a JSON RPC is actually specifically what it's called. And this is the exact same process to send transactions to Ethereum. You would submit it via JSON RPC to the Ethereum L1 directly. But instead of sending it to L1, we're going to send it to layer two. And this is essentially just a URL change or a change of chain ID to say, hey, I want to submit this to the layer two chain instead of the layer one chain. Again, just like Ethereum, this is going to go into this kind of waiting pool called a pending transaction pool. So let's add pending transaction pool, make it a little bit smaller to fit in our cloud here. So this is the pending transaction pool. So it goes into this kind of pending state waiting to be picked up. And the thing or the entity, I guess, that is going to pick that transaction up is called the sequencer. And the sequencer is one of the most vital, important pieces of this whole system. So the sequencer is essentially constantly looking at this pending transaction pool and reading those transactions to go ahead and take a look at them and decide whether or not it's going to execute them or discard them. So it's basically saying, hey, have you got any pending transactions for me? Reading those, and it's going to either execute them, execute or discard. And it basically does a couple of quick little checks to say, is this transaction actually like executable? Is it a duplicate transaction? Do you have enough funds to execute this transaction? Is it a valid call on a smart contract or a valid transfer or whatever you're doing? It just does a couple of quick checks to say, okay, well, is this actually going to work or not? And it will provide that feedback to you within a couple of seconds. So it's going to execute those transactions or discard them and provide that feedback to you. That is one of the critical roles out of two that I'm gonna go through. The second critical role is it is going to send information down to Ethereum. So sequencer is executing transactions, first of all, or discarding the transactions. Let's just simplify it and say it's executing them. And then behind the scenes, it does its second role, which is provides that information to Ethereum. So essentially it says, okay, I'm gonna take all the transactions out of the pending pool execute them. And then in the background, I'm going to be creating these batches of transactions that we talked about in the previous section and providing those to Ethereum. But what does that actually mean? Where does it send them on Ethereum? I can't just send them to this, this abyss here, right? So what actually happens is there is a smart contract deployed on Ethereum L1. It's sometimes called the roll-up smart contract or something interchangeable of depending on how the layer two is built. Let's just call it the roll-up smart contract to simplify it for now. So first of all, the sequences executed the transactions. It's now sent them down to Ethereum and on Ethereum, it's actually specifically sending them to a single specific smart contract that has been deployed, that has the role of storing information about transactions that were executed on the layer two chain. So the first role of this smart contract is to actually store information about the L2 transactions. And then second of all, in the context of zero knowledge powered layer two chains, what are we gonna do next? Because the sequencer, sure, it's executing transactions and batching them as we've just gone through. But what if it is sending batches that are complete garbage, right? Saying, let's say I'm running the sequencer, for example, and I like money, I like making money. What if I send a transaction that says, all of you viewers paid me 100 ETH? And well, I mean, maybe some of you did, hopefully. I mean, I would love to have 100 ETH, but majority of you have not sent me 100 ETH, right? But if I'm running the sequencer, I can essentially create fraudulent transactions that say things happened that didn't really happen, or maybe there's some error in the sequencer. It's producing something, some information about transactions that are incorrect or any of the kind of scenarios where things could go wrong. So the role of the smart contract is to first receive those batches of transactions, but its secondary role is to actually prove those batches, batches of transactions actually happened, right? 
And the way that it does that is using zero knowledge proofs. Specifically, it's going to utilize two kind of related parties. The first one over here is the aggregator, aggregator. And the second one is the prover. So let's add the prover here. So essentially the aggregator is going to say, hey, roll up smart contract. I want to take a look at any of the batches that haven't been proven yet and send them to my buddy, the prover. So the smart contract, oh, this maybe should be like, a, the aggregator is requesting the data from the smart contract and the smart contract is providing that data to the aggregator. Just to simplify things, we're gonna have a one-way arrow here of data going to the aggregator. So this is sending batch data. Let's simplify it. So the aggregator receives batch data and it's like, well, I wanna make sure these batches actually happened, right? The transactions within these batches uh, verified. I want them to be legit. I don't want any fraudulent transactions. And I'm going to use zero knowledge proofs to actually prove the validity of those transactions. And sometimes you'll hear this called a validity proof, which is just kind of interchangeable with zero knowledge proof that is proving the validity of a batch of transactions. So the aggregator receives the batches and it sends it to his buddy, the prover. And the prover, as the name suggests, is going to generate zero knowledge proofs and send it back to its buddy, the aggregator. So aggregator receives batches. It says, hey, Prover, can you prove this for me? Prover proves it and sends that zero knowledge proof back to Ethereum. So now the aggregator has received this ZK proof. Let's add that to this here. And then the aggregator is gonna say, all right, thanks buddy. Let's send that back to the smart contract. So it's gonna pass that zero knowledge proof down to the aggregator, it's gonna bounce up to this into the smart contract, all right? So it receives batch data and proves it and provides that zero knowledge proof back to the smart contract. Once the smart contract actually receives those zero knowledge proofs, it can't just say, yep, that looks good. It needs to verify it. So final step here is it's going to verify ZK proofs. So once it receives the zero knowledge proof from the aggregator, the layer one smart contract receives the zero knowledge proof and executes a transaction to actually verify that it is correct and, and verifies the zero knowledge proof, proves the validity of the transactions that it received. And the people verifying the zero knowledge proof are the layer one participants, right? Because the smart contract is executing like any other layer one smart contract that exists. The participants of the layer one Ethereum network, the nodes validating these transactions are the ones actually running that transaction to verify the zero knowledge proofs. So this is why you'll sometimes hear layer twos say that they inherit the security of the layer one chain, because who's actually verifying all of the layer two information? It's the same people that are participating to verify all other transactions on the Ethereum network, right? It's the nodes participating in the network, verifying transactions, proving the transactions on the layer two chain occurred are valid the same exact way they would verify any other layer one transaction. So that's why you'll hear layer twos inherit the security of Ethereum, are they are extensions of Ethereum, because at the end of the day, the layer one participants are the ones finally checking off, okay, did that zero knowledge proof hold up? Does it prove everything that perhaps happened so far on the layer two? So this is an overall high level of view, but a fundamental understanding of the key components of a layer two, including the sequencer and the aggregator, the layer one smart contracts, and how transactions flow through this process. Okay, so let's take a step back and make this high level again, and specifically focus on the term data availability. And data availability is important to differentiate the different kinds of layer twos that exist in this kind of subcategory of zero knowledge powered layer twos, which is what the CDK allows you to build. So when we talk about data availability, and I'm sure there were people that would disagree with me on this definition, but my understanding of data availability is where do you store the transaction data that occurred on the layer two, right? Let's say hundreds or thousands of transactions occurred on the layer two, the sequencer, as we mentioned in the previous section, is executing those transactions. And the second step of that is batching them up and sending them somewhere. In the previous section, we simplified it and said, it's sending transaction data to layer one Ethereum. But that is not always the case. It might send them to a different solution, like a data availability solution, like EigenDA or AvailDA, 
or Celestia. Some of these solutions that you might have heard of that specialize, I should say, in data availability solutions. Why do they do that, right? Why wouldn't you just send your transaction data to Ethereum? There's a simple answer, and it's because Ethereum is expensive. And when you are submitting a bunch of data, Ethereum is really expensive, right? The more data, and as a rule of thumb, I guess the more data you're sending as a inside of a transaction to Ethereum, the more expensive that transaction is going to be. And when you're jamming that transaction filled with as many L2 transactions as you can, that process is quite expensive. So just for reference, in the case of the Polygon ZK EVM in production today, around 80 to 90% of the cost of the Polygon ZK EVM is in that process of sending data back to Ethereum. And, and that provides a lot of security to the Polygon ZK EVM. You can essentially rebuild the whole L2 chain just from information on the layer one. So it, it is done for a reason. It's it's expensive to do that, but it provides a strong level of security to offer that as a roll-up. So let's talk about the different kinds of solutions and the different categories of what L2s there are within the zero knowledge landscape. The first category out of two categories that we're going to broadly generalize are ZK roll-ups. So roll-ups actually do what we discussed in the previous step, which is post transaction data back to Ethereum. So what that actually looks like behind the scenes is in this arrow that we've got relating the sequencer to the L1 smart contract, that is actually first sending transaction data and secondly, sending zero knowledge proofs. So these are both going to the layer one smart contract. So transaction data, there is some nuances to this. Essentially, it creates those batches of transactions and serializes them, which just means basically convert them into bytes format, which is what the Solidity smart contract can read and understand. So it basically converts all of the transaction data, like what contract you're calling, who the transaction came from, how many funds you spent on it, all of the information that you would expect in a transaction serializes it, which just means essentially convert it into a format that can be understood by the smart contract and jams a bunch of serialized transactions together into a batch. And multiple batches are sent to the layer one smart contract and stored on the layer one smart contract. So essentially all of the transaction data that occurred on the layer two are stored on Ethereum. And as you can imagine, like we just mentioned, storing data on Ethereum and calling transactions with a lot of data is expensive because you have to pay the L1 gas fees in order to store that on Ethereum. There's a second step to that as we went through in the previous kind of architectural overview that once it receives the batches, it then needs to go ahead and generate proofs that they are actually valid. So it's, a, so it's kind of a two-step process, post the data and actually post a zero knowledge proof that that data is valid. So that is rollups. It essentially uses Ethereum to store all transaction data. One further differentiation within the rollup category is what kind of format or data type, I guess you could say, of where you store the transaction data on Ethereum. Because Ethereum, you can use call data, which is like a permanent storage, or you can use a new introduction called blobs, which is essentially a new data type that was introduced specifically for this exact scenario where rollups are posting a lot of transaction data to Ethereum. So blobs are not permanent. They are kind of a temporary solution to post transaction data to Ethereum that are specifically designed for this exact situation of a layer twos posting data to layer ones. And it makes the transaction data storage a lot more affordable. However, it is not permanent. So one good resource for this is L2Beat. If you go to the data availability section here, you can see some of the differences of L2s and how they store their data. So you can see, let's say for example, Arbitrum 1 is using Ethereum, blobs, or call data. And you can see the same for base, blobs or call data, OP mainnet, blobs or call data. Whereas if you go to Polygon ZK EVM, currently this is only call data. It is going to have blobs very soon, depending on when you're watching the video, it might already have blobs. But if you look at, for example, ZK Sync Lite, Loopring, Dgate, these are only using call data. And when it says blobs or call data, that essentially means it has some logic, I believe, to say 
is core data more expensive or is blobs more expensive right now and chooses the cheaper option. But typically it's always gonna be blobs that is cheaper. So within the roll-up category, there is some separation of is the data storage permanent or not permanent on the L1 smart contract. And that is the purpose of blobs, which was introduced just a couple of months ago, again, depending on when you're watching the video. The alternative to roll-ups is Validium. And Validiums essentially do not post the transaction data to Ethereum. So the important distinction between Rollup and Validium is that Rollups do post transaction data to Ethereum. Validiums do not post transaction data to Ethereum. And instead, they either store it on one of those data availability solutions that we just mentioned, or they use what's called a data availability committee on the layer two level to store transaction data and make that data available whenever someone tries to read it. So here, let's put importantly, number one, do not store transaction data on Ethereum, but they do, do store zero knowledge proofs on Ethereum. And that might be confusing to some of you, but essentially we can still post the zero knowledge proof of what happened on the layer two without the layer one directly knowing what the transaction data is, right? So we can still post a proof of what happened and that, that what happened is actually correct and, and valid. So we post the validity proof, but we just don't store the transaction data directly on layer one. Instead, we store it somewhere else. And the kind of different options available here, I won't go into it too much. What's called a data availability committee, data availability committee, sometimes shortened to a DAC or a DAC, or you can use an alternative solution. So let's say use DA solution. And some examples here are things like Eigen DA. Some examples are Celestia, Celeste, how do you spell that? Celestia. And what's another example? Avail, Avail DA. I'm sure I'm missing some here, but you can do your own research on, on what DA solutions are available. So the reason you might wanna do this is because, as I mentioned, it is very expensive to store transaction data on Ethereum. You might want to make the chain for your users a lot cheaper in terms of gas fees at the L2 level by not posting that transaction data to Ethereum. And you still get a very strong level of security with the zero knowledge proofs because zero knowledge proofs are still proving what happened on the L2 is valid and that is being verified by the L1 smart contract. The downside to this is that you can't rebuild the entire L2 chain off of L1, right? Which is a benefit that you get from rollups because let's say for whatever reason, the solution that you're using does not provide the data to users when it's called, something goes wrong, I don't know, something horrific happens and, and you lose all your data somehow. I don't think that's likely obviously, but the point I'm trying to make is if something goes wrong with the data availability solution, then you can't kind of rebuild the whole L2 chain just based alone on what is stored on Ethereum. So Validiums, for this reason, the most popular solution when we see chains built with the CDK because most people want a high level of security, but they also want to achieve lower transaction fees for the users on the L2 level. So they're willing to say, hey, let's store the transaction data somewhere else, like one of these DA solutions, or let's use a data availability committee to store the transaction data and give our users a cheaper experience on the L2 level. A TLDR of data availability committee with two E's, I should say, is that essentially a couple of different individuals or nodes or participants on the L2 agree to participate in this data availability committee and make data available about transactions that occurred on the L2 level. And there is this diagram that I love from one of Polygon's blogs, which talks about the kind of trade-offs and, and the different scenarios in which you might wanna use a rollup or a validium. So for rollups, like we said, it posts the data of transactions to Ethereum as well as zero knowledge proofs. And this is more suitable to things like DeFi applications or heavy financial focused applications that you, know, you really strongly care and your top priority is security of the chain. And you're willing to make the sacrifice that, yep, transactions are going to be more expensive on my L2, but I'm willing to make that, that payoff, I guess, for the transactions to be stored on Ethereum. Whereas a Validium, it stores data availability in a data availability committee or in alternative DA solutions and only posts zero knowledge proofs down to Ethereum. So this is more suitable to higher scalability related 
applications or gaming applications or social applications, things where a lot of transactions are going to occur and you don't necessarily care about security as much. It still has a strong level of security, but you don't care about it as much as okay, I really want this to be scalable. I want my users to have low transaction fees or or maybe I'm gonna sponsor all of the transaction fees on this chain, right? To create a more scalable solution, which is still backed up by zero knowledge proofs with a strong level of security, just not quite as high as having data availability stored on Ethereum directly. So that is an overall summary of how zero knowledge layer two chains work and the different kinds of layer two chains within that zero knowledge category of rollups, which do store transaction data to Ethereum and Validiums, which do not store transaction data on Ethereum. One final thing I wanted to run through in this overview section is the flow of a transaction from the L2 to the L1 and exactly how you can kind of track your transaction through the diagrams and the concepts that we've run through already. So I just picked this random transaction on Polygon ZK EVM where it is looks like it's performing a swap of funds on some contract. I actually haven't really looked. It looks like they're swapping USDC with wrapped ETH here. This is a random transaction that I picked. And what I wanted to show you is how exactly you can track and trace the steps of a transaction from L2, how it gets included in a block, how it gets included in a batch, how it goes to L1 and how it gets verified on the L1. So on the Polygon scan here, we are tracking transaction O, okay? And then the transaction was successful. So it was executed successfully by the sequencer. And you can see here in this block section, it is included in a block, specifically block 12952601. And this was around 16 days ago. So it was first of all included in a block. And if we take a look at this block, you can see this specific block had, let's see, two transactions within the block. And if we click on this, you can see, okay, first of all, we had our transaction, which was OXE here. And then there was another random transaction of withdraw from someone else, right? I, I don't know what the transaction is either, but essentially this specific block had two transactions in it, one of which was ours. So the kind of logical sequence here is, okay, a transaction gets included in a block, a block contains multiple transactions. If we go back to our transaction here, you can also see that it is included inside of a batch. And we should be able to see the batch index here. So you can see this is the batch that it was included in. So first of all, a transaction is included in a block and a transaction is also included in a batch. So if we click into this batch here, you can see, okay, this batch number 2041736 includes 10 transactions. And if we click again in the transactions of this batch, we should be able to find, oh, all right. So the relationship here is multiple transaction goes into one block. Multiple transactions also go into one batch. All right. And what gets sent to Ethereum is those batches in the case of rollups, right? As we talked about the differences between rollups and validiums in the previous section. So just to simplify things, let's assume which is correct. In this case, the Polygon ZK EVM is a rollup, which is sending transaction data to Ethereum. So as we mentioned, the sequencer has now executed the transaction. This transaction has been included into a batch by the sequencer. And now that batch is going to be sent to Ethereum. And the Polygon scan or ZK EVM scan here, it actually shows you the exact transaction hashes where the transactions get sent to Ethereum and where they were verified on Ethereum. So you can see here, L1 committed batch transaction. So this is the transaction that was sent to Ethereum containing this batch. So essentially it's saying the sequencer sent this batch of transactions inside this transaction here. So if we go to this, you'll see it swaps over, sorry for the flashbang, this swaps over to Etherscan. And now we're dealing with L1 transactions. So you can see here, this again was 16 days ago, and this transaction is sending a batch of transactions from the L2 to the L1. And what we can do is if we click on show more here, you can see if we super zoom in, this is calling a function called sequence batches. So what we're looking at here is the L1 rollup smart contract. So the sequencer, if you remember in our diagram, the sequencer 
sends it down to L1, specifically sends it to a rollup smart contract. Even more specifically, it's calling a function called sequence batches. So hopefully the name is kind of self-explanatory. Sequence is just saying, okay, let's send the batches down to Ethereum. And you can see it contains multiple batches. So here are the actual, I think we have to decode this first, decode the input data. So you can see in this case, there's an array of batches. So it looks like the first item in that array is this serialized form of multiple transactions within the batch. So here within the first batch, there are multiple transactions. And if we scroll down, we can actually see how many batches were included in this sequence. So you can see the fourth item in that transaction or the fifth item, I should say, is again, more and more transactions. And we finally reach, looks like there were five or six batches in this sequence here. So what we can look at there is, well, what batch did we include that transaction in? You can see here it is 2041736. So this sequence sent multiple batches to Ethereum. And you can see it started at batch 2041730. So that's not our batch, that's six batches before because where 2041736, whereas this is 2041730. So how can we see if ours was included? Well, we can kind of deduce already because there was six batches sent. So if we add six to that number, we can kind of see, okay, well, zero, one, two, three, four, five, which is six. Then we can assume, well, six plus zero is 2041736, which is our batch. I believe we can actually even see the last batch that was sent if we go into the logs here. So we can zoom out a little bit. And as you can see, if we go into the logs, you can see the last batch sequenced in this particular transaction was indeed 2041736, which is the batch that our transaction was included in. So we can see, okay, it got included in a block, it got included in a batch. This transaction to Ethereum includes this batch. So now we know our batch is stored on the Ethereum smart contract. And if you watched the, well, if I did a good job of explaining the architecture of what happens next, you'll know that it needs to be proven using zero knowledge proofs. And again, you can see this on the Explorer here. So beneath the transaction that was sent to Ethereum, we have the next transaction, which proves that batch on Ethereum, which is this L1 verified batch transaction. So we open this again, this is gonna take us to Etherscan because this is an, an Ethereum transaction on the L1. And this is the transaction that posted the zero knowledge proof that proves the validity of this batch here. Okay, so if we take a look, whoops, wrong tab. If we take a look at this, this is coming from the aggregator sent to, again, the rollup smart contract on L1. And if we click on more details, you can see specifically, this is calling a function called verify batches. And the second part of that is it's coming from the trusted aggregator. So this is coming from this specific aggregator and it's calling verify batches. Again, if we decode this input data, you can see, all right, here is the rollup that we're posting to all of the information. And the final part of this is actually the proof, right? So here is the zero knowledge proof that shows you the exact zero knowledge proof that was posted to verify the validity of that transaction. And I believe we can see the logs here. You can see calls verify batches, update some information on the L1, and you can go into more details of exactly what is happening under the hood here. But this is how you can track exactly what the transaction you did on L2 is doing and when and how and what is exactly happening under the hood of the process of the architecture that we've just gone through. So after all of that kind of conceptual knowledge of what layer twos are and how they really work under the hood, I wanted to quickly summarize what the Polygon CDK is, the Polygon Chain Development Kit. It is essentially a open source stack for you to build your own layer two chains powered by the same innovations and research and all of the kind of years of effort that Polygon and the community has put into building productionized ZK powered layer two chains. So the CDK is a way for you to easily bootstrap all of the necessary components and then kind of plug and play or customize each 
aspect of the chain that you're going to build. So you can pick and choose exactly how each aspect of the chain is going to operate. You can customize every aspect of the chain to meet the needs of the solution that you want to build. So CDK is going to allow you to really build your own layer two chain in the exact way that you want it to, enabling any customizations that you want in this modular fashion. So what we're gonna do next is we're going to pull down a repository that allows us to spin up all of the infrastructure of our layer two chain locally. And we'll see how we can configure this to run in a testnet environment. And we'll quickly run through all of the details that you need to dive around the code, start making these customizations for yourself before continuing on to actually launching this layer two chain. Right before we dive into it, I wanted to make a quick important note that the tool that we're going to use at the time I'm recording this video, I'll leave a note in the description or the comments if it has changed. At the time I'm recording this video, this tool is not intended for production use. If you wanna to go to production, you should contact either the Polygon Labs team directly or one of our implementation providers. I do have another video on my channel of doing this exact process with an implementation provider, which has no code or any kind of customizations that we're going to go through in this video. But this is not a tool that is intended for mainnet use, at least the time I'm recording the video. So I wanna make a very important note there. This tool that we're going to use was built to essentially test out in a local environment, how the different pieces of the stack work together and quickly get started running tests and, and performing different operations and, and testing out the performance of the chains and things like this. So this is not intended for mainnet use and not recommended for you to go to production alone. For that, you can contact our team directly or get in touch with one of our providers that will run this infrastructure for you. So quick note there before we dive right into getting started into building this on our machine. So let's get started. All right, so we're ready to start the development process. And I'm gonna run through a couple of the tools that we're gonna be using to actually build out the L2. So if you watched our overview section, you don't have to, but if you did, you will have noticed there are a lot of different pieces of an L2 that you need to create. And I didn't go into as much detail as some of the diagrams that you'll find in the repositories that we're going to use, but there are a couple of components. Well, there's, there's a lot of different components that make up an L2. And each of these components are going to be launched or instantiated inside of Docker containers. And we're going to kind of set up each of these services inside of containerized Docker containers. And they're going to interact with each other in to create our L2 chain. Right, So each of these different services is going to be what makes up our L2 chain in a functional way. So what we're gonna use is this Polygon CD Kurtosis package, right? And Kurtosis is another open source tool that allows you to launch environments of containerized services when you want them, where you want them, the way you want them with one-liners. So this is an open source tool not built by the Polygon team. This is the repository that is kind of utilizing Kurtosis under the hood, specifically to launch all of the containerized services that make up the layer two chain that we're going to create with all of the configurations and customizations available for us inside of this package here. So what we really care about is the Polygon CDK Kurtosis package. And I'll leave a link for this in the description, or you can just Google this and find it on GitHub yourself, but ideally click the link in the description. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into the terminal. First, we're going to copy this command here to set it up on our local machine. And this will assume you already have Git installed on your computer. So I'm not gonna start from scratch and bore you with installation of Git. I will show you the necessary dependencies for this package, but I assume you already have some development knowledge of what Git is, how to clone a repository and, and move around in the terminal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into my new terminal scene. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna move into my dev directory here. And since I'm on Windows, if you're on Mac or if you're on Linux, you don't need to worry about this, but I am going to use a L environment just so I can use the Linux commands and operate smoothly. Uh, if you are on a Windows machine, you will need to use SL or use a Linux environment, depending on, on where you're actually building this. So now I am on Excel or a Linux environment. I can go ahead and clone that repository. So I'm gonna run git clone and 
clone down that Kurtosis CDK. I've already got it, so I'm just gonna make a new directory for our tutorial here and run that command again in our tutorial folder. So that's gonna clone down all of the code of the Kurtosis CDK package that we just ran through. So let's change directories into that Kurtosis CDK. And now we are here and you can see we're in the Kurtosis CDK package and all of the files available to us. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up this in my text editor now, which is Visual Studio Code. So I'm just gonna open this current repository in Visual Studio Code on my local machine here. So here's a little sneak preview of some documentation I'm running on localhost for the CDK right now. Hopefully this is already live by the time you're watching the video. If you go into the Get It Started section, you'll see I've listed here, here are the hardware requirements and the software dependencies that you need in order to actually do the steps that we're gonna do in this video. So as I already mentioned, you'll want a Linux-based operating system. You'll want a pretty decent amount, I guess that's a a standard amount of RAM and a decent CPU and an AMD 64 architecture system. Ideally, you can do this on your local laptop, your home computer, or if you need, you can do it on a cloud environment just to meet the minimum hardware sort of standards that we need to actually get things up and running. Some of the software dependencies you'll need, I'm about to show you exactly how you can test out what you're missing, what versions you need on your machine from the repository that we just cloned. So let's swap back to our terminal here. And I kind of already spoiled it, but what we're gonna do is if we see inside of the scripts folder, if we run in the scripts, there is a tool check script bash script that is going to see what versions of what dependencies you have installed on your machine. So you can see I've already got something that is different from what it's expecting. You can see I've installed Kurtosis, but I don't have the correct version. What it will run through is different depending on what you have installed on your machine, but this is super helpful to right off the bat identify, okay, this is exactly what I need. This is what versions I need. This is what I have on my machine, what I don't have, what I go ahead and install. Regardless, I'm gonna show you how to install these dependencies here of Docker Engine, Kurtosis, Foundry, and a couple of other dependencies to help us test out the chain. So I'll quickly walk you through the process now. The first dependency you'll need is Docker, so we can run these services inside of containers. So go ahead and go to the Docker website, just go through the installation process, specifically Docker Engine and install Docker Engine in this overview tab. You can see, depending on what machine you're using, what operating system, et cetera, et cetera, just go ahead and download the right version for you. And then just launch the Docker desktop app is how I'm using it, or just start the, the Docker service before you rerun that original command that we just ran. Once you have Docker installed, I use the Docker desktop app and it tells me in the bottom right here, as you can see, it is v4.3.1.1 and I don't have any updates available. So I'm on the latest version of Docker. And then from the command line, we can run docker dash dash version just to confirm we are actually indeed running and have got Docker installed correctly. To make sure that Docker is actually running, we can do Docker LS. To make sure the Docker service is actually running, we can do Docker image LS. You can see it's gonna print a bunch of the images that I have created over the past couple of years, which is kind of irrelevant, but we just wanna check that this service is actually running. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna swap on over to the Kurtosis documentation. And depending on the operating system that you have, if you're on Mac, if you're on, on Linux like I am, in the commands that you're gonna run are gonna be different. So that's why I'm showing you the raw documentation here. We do currently at the time of recording need a specific version of the Kurtosis CLI, which is why I'm on the installing old versions page. So I'm just gonna copy and paste the commands from this section, nothing much to explain here. We're just installing the actual Kurtosis package. So I'll copy and paste the first command, copy paste the second command, copy paste the third command, and finally copy paste this last command. So let's swap on over to our terminal scene and I'm going to install Kurtosis CLI version. And the version that we want is 0 0.8, whoops, 0 0.89. Let's do 0 0.0, 0 0.89.0. 0, and that is going to go ahead and install the version of the Kurtosis CLI that is currently compatible with the Polygon CDK. The beauty of this is again, the first script that we ran to check if what we had installed was compatible is going to confirm or deny what, what version we have is actually going to work. So we can rerun that, which was the tool check command. So dot slash scripts tool check dot sh. 
I'll rerun this and now you can see instead of telling us we've got the wrong ketosis version, we have the correct one, which is 0.89.0. We have the recommended version of Docker installed. We also might want to install a couple of other dependencies to kind of play around with or test with the chain and submit transactions or do load tests and things like this. So you can see, you might also want to install the following, JQ, YQ, Cast, which is Foundry and the Poly CLI. So let's go ahead and install these before continuing. So for Cast and the kind of Foundry tools we're going to use, I'm just on the Foundry book here, book.getfoundry.sh. And here is the command that I'm gonna run. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy paste this into the terminal here. This will install detected preferred shell. So let's go ahead and run this command as well as it recommends and then run foundry up. And this is gonna go ahead and install the foundry tool chain, which is gonna allow us to more easily do things like generate public key, private key pairs and, and submit transactions. So that looks good. We have installed foundry now. So let's again, run that check command tool check.sh looks like cast is installed. So now we need JQ, YQ, and poly CLI. For JQ, we just need to run sudo apt get install JQ. So this one's pretty simple. And we are done with JQ. We'll quickly run the tool check command again. And now we have JQ installed. So now we need to do YQ. It actually provides you the link. So let's go ahead and open that. And this actually requires Python to pip install YQ. So I'll show you how to install Python and then install the YQ via pip. So to install Python, what we're gonna do is sudo apt update, and then we'll do sudo, and we'll give it a minute to finish off here. Sudo apt install Python three, cool. And then sudo apt install Python three pip. All right, so now we have Python and pip installed. Now we can use pip install YQ, whoops pip install YQ. So now we have YQ installed. We'll quickly do a sanity check of the tool check script command. You can see we have JQ, YQ, and cast. So that was JQ and YQ. Now we just need the poly CLI. So let's go ahead and install poly CLI here. The poly CLI or the polygon CLI is available at this repo, which will be linked in the description as well. The there are a couple of dependencies to install this. So let's go ahead and install Go onto our machine as well, if you haven't already. So I'll go ahead and download this Go package for Linux. So for me, I'm gonna grab this one here. I'm just gonna copy the link address and in our Linux terminal, I'm gonna run you get and paste that in. So it's gonna go ahead and download that for us onto our docell setup here. Then I'm gonna extract this file out. So we're gonna do sudo tar-c into the user slash local and we'll do dash x z f and we'll copy the name of what we just downloaded here so that will extract it out into this repository here and then all we need to do is just export the path to the extracted file which will be slash go slash bin within that and then apply the changes so we'll do source and tilde slash bash .rc, And then we should be able to verify that we actually have Go installed. So now we have Go 1.22.4, and this is the operating system specifically that I installed here. So now you can see the next step to this is to install make. So we'll just do sudo apt install make. Then let's just do sudo apt install bc as well. And for protoc, I'm just gonna say protoc, we can do sudo apt install proto buff compiler. So let's go ahead and run sudo install that, sudo apt install, sorry, sudo apt install proto buff compiler. And that is, I believe, the final step of the installation. And then from the Polygon CLI repository, what we're gonna do is run make install, and this will actually install the Poly CLI available for us to actually use in our Kurtosis repository. And that is the final step of the setup. We're going to run one final command that I'll copy here and swap on over to our terminal scene. And then we are ready to check. We've got all of the necessary dependencies to utilize this Polygon Kurtosis package to its full potential and actually start diving into the code seeing how you can customize different aspects, how the code works, and then actually start to run the code to start deploying each of these services inside of Docker containers. 
Finally, we'll run the export path command so we can access the poly CLI from the other repository. So we'll swap back to our Kurtosis repository from the Polygon CLI. And then let's do poly CLI dash dash version just to check that it is actually installed. Doesn't look like the version flag works, but you can see here are all of the available commands. And then if we finally run the tool check script one final time, you can see we have all of the right dependencies installed, all of the correct versions installed, and we get a nice pretty message here to say you are ready to go. So let's go ahead and start diving into the code now. Okay, so when you jump right into the code base, the first thing that I like to do that is helpful is just to kind of understand, okay, where does this kind of code start, right? How can I follow the path of when I actually run this thing, what exactly is it going to execute? So I'm not gonna go through each individual file. What I'm gonna do is show you two key files that'll allow you to follow the path of how each individual file is kind of getting pulled in and executed in this chronological sequence. So the first file that I wanted to show you as you open up this Kurtosis CDK repository in your text editor is the main.star file. And I'm gonna show you this and it looks a bit raw. We have a .star extension. We have all of this plain white text. First of all, what is .star and how do I get this to be more readable to my eyes, right? So first of all, .star is a starlock file. So starlock is a Python dialect. So if you've ever written Python, this should look extremely familiar to you. And if you haven't, don't worry, Python and, and Python dialects are very generally easily to understand and read. As you can see, the syntax is pretty nice. But the first thing I want you to do is go over to the extensions and search up Kurtosis and install this Kurtosis extension here. So I'm gonna go ahead and install this Kurtosis extension in my WSL environment and then go ahead and close this. And we'll go back to the main star file. And you can see now we have all of this nice little syntax highlighting. We can kind of understand, okay, this is what's going on a bit more easily. So first file I wanted to show you is this main.star file. And then we're gonna show you this params.yml file. So first of all, main.star, as it suggests, is the main entry point to everything that we're going to execute. And Kurtosis expects this run function. So when we actually try and use the Kurtosis CLI that we've just installed in the previous section, we're going to execute this run function and it is going to run through all of this code that you see within this file. What actually happens is this run function is kind of like the hub of this repository. So you can see in this first like 10, 12 lines, depending on when you're watching the video, might be a bit more, might be less. But in these import statements, what we're doing is we're first saying, all right, let's import this step, let's import this step, this step, this step, this step, so on and so forth. And then throughout this run function, it's going to execute each of those steps in chronological order. And if you watched the kind of conceptual overview section, this some of this might look familiar, hopefully if I've done a good job. So the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna deploy a local L1. It's then gonna deploy the smart contracts on the L1, some databases that kind of run alongside the infrastructure that we've talked about already, the central environment, which will include things like the sequencer and the aggregator as part of the ZK EVM nodes. We have the bridge, we have a permissionless node, which is pretty much the same as the central environment of deploy the sequencer and the aggregator and so on and so forth. And then we have some stuff that is kind of new, like observability, the block explorer, a test workload, blot gang, and an alternative sequencer called Aragon here. So a couple of new things and hopefully a couple of things that are familiar to you. But what's gonna happen throughout this run function is essentially as the developer, we're going to say, do I wanna deploy the L1? Do I wanna do this step? Do I wanna do this step? And we can kind of pick and choose what pieces of the architecture that we want to deploy. And this run function will take our arguments as a source of truth and be like, okay, the, the dev wants to deploy this and this, but doesn't want to deploy this. And it will go through each of these steps, pulling in logic from these other files. For example, the first step might be to deploy a local L1, for example. So you can see here, it's importing Ethereum package. And if we go up to the top, line number two is the Ethereum package, which is pulling in ethereum.star. So if we look for that file, ethereum.star, okay, this pulls in the Ethereum package, goes ahead and deploys a local L1 for us. And then we move on to the next step. So if we scroll down, deploy the ZK EVM contracts on the local L1. Again, it's the same exact pattern. It's going to import a module, 
This time it's called deploy ZK EVM contracts package. So if we scroll again up to the top. That is line number three, deploy ZK EVM contracts package. That pulls in this file, deploy ZK EVM contracts.star. We can see that on the left-hand side. Okay, that is going to run this function. So it's going to essentially execute the logic that exists in this file. And it'll take in some parameters from the file that we'll go through next, which is params.yml. But generally, if you want to explore around the code and see exactly what's happening, you can pretty much run through this main.star file and see, all right, it's deploying a local L1. What does that actually do? Let me check out the package that it's importing and running. All right, it's deploying a deploying the ZK EVM contracts on L1. It's then going to pull in this package and run the logic in that file and so on and so forth, right? It does this like 10 or 12 steps in logical order. And what we're gonna do later on in the video is see how we can specify exactly what steps we wanna execute and the parameters that we can provide to actually sort of configure and customize exactly how these steps execute. So without going into extreme detail of what each of the files do by themselves, I know some of you will wanna just continue progressing and get started and actually see this thing going live on your machine, whereas some of you want to explore more deeply the code base and understand exactly what we're going to be executing. So I'll just give you that quick introduction to this main kind of hub file is my mental model of it, how it pulls in all of this logic. And if you wanna inspect more deeply what exactly is happening in each of these steps, you can kind of say, okay, well, what happens in the bridge step? I'll go check out this bridge file and see exactly what we're doing in here. So you can kind of dive as deeply as you want to. I just wanted to give you that quick introduction of, okay, here's exactly what is happening. And you can go into the level of depth that you are comfortable with. The second file I wanted to show you is this params.yml file. And if you've never used IML or YAML, it is essentially a configuration style, a style of file. So you have this like key value pair structure where you say this configuration flag should be set to this value. And you can see we have like hundreds of configurations that you can make in how this main.star file and each of these kind of nested star files, I guess, are going to behave. So what that means is when we actually use the Kurtosa CLI, we're going to say execute main.stars run function and provide the params.yml file as kind of an argument to say that's how I want the main function to behave with this set of configuration. So you can see, this is why I wanted to introduce these two files in particular, is this is actually what we're going to execute. And this is the configuration setup that we're going to execute that main star file with. So what is exactly in this file? You can see we have uh, how many? We have 181 lines within this file to say, okay, here's exactly how I want it to behave. And as we start to deploy this, we're gonna configure a couple of different options within this file to show you how you can configure and change different things in regards to your L2 setup. But essentially this is what we're providing as arguments to how the main function is going to perform. So again, I won't go into extreme detail of each of these 180 lines, but you can feel free to kind of read through the comments, read through what the variables are named and the default setups in terms of the configuration. And you can go ahead and try and play around if you want, but we will change some of these values as we progress through the video as well. So just for now, have a look through the main star, get a basic understanding of the steps that are being executed and have ha also have a look through the params.yml to see, okay, these are the default values that we're providing and see, okay, maybe I could customize this to be specific to the thing that I wanna build, or maybe I could customize some aspect of this configuration file when we go ahead and run this main.star function. All right, so this is kind of an important segue to say the way that I'm gonna showcase how you can get more comfortable in customizing the parameters and changing the steps in the main.star file to make the customizations and configurations that you want for your L2 is we're going to change the default behavior from deploying the L2 on a local L1. So if you remember in the previous step, one of the instructions in the main function is to deploy a local L1 that you can deploy the contracts to. What we're gonna do is we're going to deploy our smart contracts and our L2 infrastructure to an Ethereum testnet instead of deploying our own local L1. So we get more comfortable to make configuration changes and make changes to the steps that are going to execute. So hopefully you'll be more comfortable and gain a deeper understanding of, okay, this is the flow of changing the behavior of the L2 that I'm gonna deploy. 
and apply that to any of the configurations that you have in mind when you're going to deploy your L2. So what I'm gonna show you next is how you can get some testnet funds on an Ethereum testnet. So there are a couple of different options. You can see in the background here, I have a Holsky, Sepolia, or Ephemery, I believe it's pronounced. We're going to use Sepolia in this video. You can kind of pick and choose which testnet you want to, depending on when you're watching this video as well. It might not even be viable for you to use Sepolia, so that's why I wanted to mention, but I wanna make a very important segue here to say, in this video, I'm going to use my main wallet for the faucet, okay? For the faucet only. I will get funds into my main wallet and transfer them to a new wallet. At no point I will ever export my main wallet's private key. I will never use a wallet that has real funds in it. I will never use an existing wallet. I will never use the wallet ever again for anything real. You should do the same as me, right? If you need to use your main wallet for the faucet because it does require sometimes a Gitcoin passport score just to prove that you're human, use it only for the faucet. Do not ever use your main wallet or any wallet with real funds in it for the development process. If you do, you will lose all of the money associated with that wallet, okay? So what we're going to do is I'm gonna show you how to generate a new wallet using the CLI tool that we installed. And we're gonna use that as the development wallet throughout this process. Do not ever export your private key from your main wallet. I cannot stress that enough. You will lose all of your money if you do that. So with that little disclaimer out of the way, and I realize this is kind of sketchy, but this is from the official Ethereum documentation. You can check for yourself on the Ethereum documentation. It will link you here as an option to get testnet funds. I realize the URL looks like a scam and the website looks like it was designed 25 years ago. However, this is an actual resource. So this can pretty much give you as many testnet ETH as you want. It just takes a little bit of resources from your computer, right? It does, I don't know, actually know what it does under the hood to be honest, but it does use your CPU to generate testnet ETH that you can claim. I don't know the full details of how it works, but essentially this will allow you to claim a lot of testnet funds and you can transfer them to the wallet that we're going to generate in the next step. So just paste your wallet address in here. It's not gonna ask you to connect your wallet. It's not gonna ask you to sign any transactions or messages. So if it does, you're probably on the wrong page. Once you paste your wallet address in here, you can click start mining and you want around 25 ETH for this next step. So it might take a little while. You might need to go make a coffee or, or grab a drink, whatever you wanna do and come back and click the claim and you'll have the necessary amount of testnet funds that we need for the next steps. So you can use Sepolia. I believe Holsky is actually faster if you want to use Holsky to more quickly mine this ETH on the testnet. And depending on when you're watching the video, maybe if you're watching in a few years time, Sepolia might not even be an option. So it doesn't really matter what testnet you're gonna use. It just matters for the next steps that we're gonna use in the tutorial. I'll use the Sepolia RPC. You can just replace it with Holsky or whatever the name of the new testnet is from the future, all right? So just go ahead and grab around 25 testnet funds. Again, we're going to generate a new wallet in the next step. Do not use your main wallet. It is okay if you mine the funds to your main wallet and transfer them to the, to the generated wallet, that is okay. But just again, don't export your main wallet's private key because you will lose all of your money. All right, with that little scary disclaimer out of the way, go ahead and claim yourself some testnet funds if you haven't already and come back to this video. As I mentioned, you'll need around 25. So it might take a little while. But once you've got those, you'll be set for the rest of the video. Okay, so if you remember in the first step of the main star function, we have this deploy L1 flag set to true. And then the first step of it, of this run function is going to say deploy a local L1. Now, since we're going to show you how to deploy this onto Sepolia or Holsky or whatever testnet you chose to use, we obviously don't want this to, we don't want this step to happen, right? So what I'm gonna show you is using the YQ CLI tool that we installed earlier, how to kind of modify the setup of this repository so that we're going to change this step to use Sepolia in this case, I'm using Sepolia for this tutorial to actually deploy the following steps onto Sepolia rather than the local L1 that we deploy in this step here. So again, let's swap over to our fancy new terminal scene. 
Hope everyone is enjoying this as much as I am. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use YQ, which is the tool that we used, or tool that we installed rather, to modify YAML files essentially is what it does. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do dash Y to suggest that we want to output the results in the YAML format. We're then gonna do dash dash in place to actually make it modify the file itself. And if we quickly swap back to VS Code, in the params.yml file, you can see we have this kind of key in the YAML file called deploy underscore L1. So what we wanna do is change this to say false. And obviously you could just go in and change this itself, but I wanna show you how we can use a CLI tool to kind of uh, jump around and modify things in case you want to make further customizations to the L2 that you're deploying. So what we're essentially gonna do is swap this from true to false. So if we go back to our terminal here, we're going to say at the root, which is dot, and the name of the flag that we wanna change is deploy L1. And we're gonna set that equal to false and we'll close that little string out. And then the final step is we're going to say, hey, actually change this in the params.yml file. So if we go ahead and run this and then swap back over to our VS code scene, you can see on line number one, this is now false instead of true. So it really depends on the workflow that you want. Do you want to run commands to modify this file or would you rather just modify the flags themselves directly? It's really up to you in what you wanna change. Just for the simplicity in this video, I wanted to quickly show you that as an option via the terminal and the CLI tools that we installed. And maybe that might be better for you if you're doing this in kind of a workflow or a CI CD workflow or something like that. But for the purpose of this video, we can probably just go ahead and modify these text files directly to swap on over these flags. So just to make things a little easier and keep all of our comments and things like that, I actually just went ahead and reverted that change and kept all of our comments and just manually go ahead and change this to false, just so we have all of the comments and we can kind of explore what each of these flags are doing. So I would recommend to do the same unless you have a specific need to use that YQ CLI tool, which, which might be the only option if you're doing this in automations or, or things like that. So that's why I wanted to show that as an option. But for us, we're probably just gonna go ahead and modify this file directly. And if you're wondering how does that actually work, what we're gonna do is we're going to run from the terminal. We'll use the Kurtosis CLI to actually provide this file as an argument, and it'll essentially read all of these options and see, hey, okay, deploy L1 is false. Let me go ahead and skip that step inside of the main.star file. So anything we modify in this file, when we run the Kurtosis CLI command to actually kick off this main function here, it's gonna read in all of this and say, all right, I'm gonna do this step, if it's true, I'm gonna do this step. If it's true, I'm gonna do this step if it's true, and so on and so forth. So all we've really done is let the CLI know when we provide this file, hey, we can go ahead and actually skip the deploy L1 step. So now our deployment process will actually skip over the local L1 deployment step. What we're gonna do next is kind of a two part process. We're first going to tell the repository that we actually want to use uh, Sepolia as the L1. So we're gonna provide things like the chain ID, the RPC URLs for the Sepolia network. And then we're going to generate a couple of different accounts for the different roles that we need in the system. So if you watch the uh, conceptual overview section of the video, you might remember us talking about the sequencer, the aggregator, and a couple of different roles in the system. Each of those roles need accounts. So we're going to generate new accounts. And by accounts, I mean public key, private key pairs. So really we're generating new wallets. And in this video, I wanted to make another disclaimer here, just to make this video as easy to follow as possible for you. I don't blur any of the seed phrases. I don't blur any of the private keys. I don't blur anything. I just pretty much leave everything out in the open. And the reason for that is because we don't have any real money in these accounts that we're using for development purposes. And by we, I mean you and me. However, in your case, you should get into the practice of keeping your private keys safe, unlike I am leaking them in this video. You should never reveal your private keys. You should never commit them to a GitHub repository. You should never share them. And just be really careful with these values because the private key gives full control over each of these accounts. But what we're gonna do next is we're going to actually use cast to generate a new wallet for us. The way that we're gonna do that is simply say cast wallet new dash mnemonic. So cast wallet new mnemonic. And as you can see, we have our seed phrase here. We have the public key 
and the private key pair for this account that we've just generated. And the reason that we're doing this is because inside of the params.yml file, you can see around line 90 here, it starts putting these public key, private key pairs for the different roles of the system. So you can see for the sequencer, there is a public key, private key pair. For the aggregator, there's a public key, private key pair. For the claim, trans claim transaction manager, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a bunch of public key, private key pairs, and we don't want to use the default values if we're going to a testnet environment. For a local L1 deployment, it's okay because we're not really doing anything publicly that other people can see. But since we're deploying this to Sepolia, these wallet addresses will pretty much have uh, the funds drained whenever we send them to those addresses. So we're gonna use the public key private key pairs to uh, replace these public key private key pairs to do the roles of things like the sequencer, the aggregator, the stuff that we've talked about in the architecture overviews and things like this. We're going to replace these hard-coded addresses with some of the ones that we generate using the CLI. What we're gonna do is based on this params.yml file, you can see each of these are a different public key, private key pair. However, they are derived from this mnemonic phrase, right? So what we can do is based on one mnemonic, we can actually generate multiple accounts from that mnemonic seed phrase, right? So in the case of our terminal, I just generated the new one here just because I cleared it from the terminal. You can see we have this seed phrase and what we installed earlier was the poly CLI. And we're gonna use the poly CLI to take in this seed phrase and essentially generate multiple accounts or public key, private key pairs, such as this one, based on that seed phrase. So what we can do just to showcase this is poly CLI, and we can just do dash dash help to get an overview of what commands are available. You'll find we have the poly CLI wallet command. So down here, the very bottom one, poly CLI wallet. And you can see BIP 39 ish is kind of related to the mnemonic seed phrase, right? This follows the BIP 39 standard, I believe. I actually don't have a deep level of knowledge about this, but it's going to inspect the BIP 39 seed phrase and generate different accounts based on that seed phrase. So if we get some help on this poly CLI wallet command, we can see this accepts a mnemonic. So a mnemonic phrase used to generate entropy. And then it also accepts this addresses flag. So the number of addresses to generate based on that mnemonic. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something like poly wallet pass, I'm sorry, poly CLI wallet, pass the mnemonic, and then say generate however many addresses or accounts we need based on the roles inside of this params.yml file here. So we'll need one for the sequencer, we'll need one for the aggregator, we need one for this, 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 so on and so forth. So essentially we're using the mnemonic seed phrase that we generated to create multiple accounts based on the same seed phrase. So we'll go ahead and clean this up. So what we can do is we can run that new mnemonic command again. So this time we've got a new one, we have a new seed phrase and we wanna generate multiple wallet addresses based on this same seed phrase here. So what we can do is using the poly CLI, poly CLI wallet inspect, we're gonna copy this seed phrase here, open string, paste the seed phrase in, close the string, and then we define how many accounts we want to create based on this seed phrase here. So for that, we're gonna do addresses and just let's say one for simplicity here. And I realized we missed the mnemonic flag here. So dash dash mnemonic and then paste the mnemonic and then dash dash addresses to specify how many accounts we wanna generate based on this particular mnemonic here. So if we run this command, you can see we get a new account which has the private key here in hex private key and the public key inside of ETH address here. So this isn't that pretty to deal with, right? You can see we get a ton of information, but what we wanna do is purely extract out the private key and the ETH address to replace these values here. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show you a little bit of an advanced command. And this command, I will leave a link in the description for you to go ahead and copy paste. But essentially we just do the exact same thing as what we did. So you can see we generate nine accounts based on this particular seed phrase. So we define the seed phrase that we wanna generate it based off. We use some of the CLI tools that we installed in the previous steps. So this time we're using JQ to extract out that ETH address. So if you take a look, we have the ETH address, which is the public key. And then we extract out the hex private key, which again was a private key. And then we use awk to kind of format 
those nine addresses into these different roles here. So you can see we have the sequencer, aggregator, claim transaction manager, et cetera, et cetera, which maps up to these roles here. So this command is basically just doing what we just did nine times and formatting it in a way where we can just copy and paste, replace all of these roles with the new accounts that we've created based on a private key. So let's go ahead and generate a new mnemonic once again. So what I'm gonna do is using this seed phrase, I'll go ahead and copy this, and then we will set the seed variable as that in a string. So open string, seed phrase, close string. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to copy this big long command that I will leave a link in the description or if you are, feel like typing a bunch of stuff out, basically we generate nine accounts based on this seed phrase that we just stored in this variable. We use JQ to extract out the public key, private key pair format it using this, this TSV flag here. And we use awk to kind of put it in a format where we define the sequencer, the aggregator, transaction manager, admin, so on and so forth. So now you can see this spits out a big long string for us that we can just copy paste starting from the sequencer, ending at the proof signer. What we can do is we copy and paste this across and then you can see 115 for me is the proof signer private key. So let's go ahead and select this all the way up to the sequencer and go ahead and replace those values. So you can see if we take a look at the difference here, whoops, we zoom out a little bit for you. You can see all we've done is just generate and maybe let's tab these in. All we've done is generate the public key, private key pairs for each of these roles as they were formatted in this params.yml file. So hopefully that makes sense. We've just used the CLI to generate a bunch of accounts based on an individual seed phrase and replaced those hard-coded accounts with our own generated accounts inside the params file. Now we're going to do very similar process, but for this L1 pre-allocated mnemonic account here. So we're gonna generate a new mnemonic again using the same command. This account here, what it does is two key things. So the first thing it does is actually sends funds to these accounts, right? So it sends funds to the sequencer so it can pay for the gas fees of sequencing batches. It sends funds to the aggregator so it can pay for posting those proofs to verify batches on the L1 smart contract. So the that is the first thing it does. It sends funds out to the other accounts. And the second thing it does is it actually is the account that is gonna deploy the smart contracts on L1. So it needs to have a fair bit of funds. So what we're gonna do is we're first going to use the CLI again, generate a new mnemonic, and we will go from there. All right, so let's jump back into the terminal. I'll clean this up. And again, we can just run that new, new, mnemonic command. So cast wallet new mnemonic. Again, this generates, once again, it generates a public key, private key pair and a seed phrase for us. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy paste this phrase, replace that inside of our VS code here with L1 pre-allocated mnemonic, paste that into this value here. And surrounding the L1 pre-allocated mnemonic, we also see some interesting things like the L1 chain ID, the amount of ether we want to send to each of the accounts the RPC URL, things that we need to configure since we're modifying it from a local L1 deployment to a Sepolia deployment. Obviously these are not going to work for Sepolia and we wanna change this. We don't have as much ether as we wanna to send to the other roles. So what we're gonna do next is replace this L1 configuration with the information about Sepolia or if you're from the future, you're not using Sepolia, maybe you found Holski easier, I'll show you how to get the necessary information for you to replace the L1 information with whatever testnet or environment you are using in your setup. The way that I like to get my information about chains is using ThirdWeb, of course. I use ThirdWeb for a lot of things, but thirdweb.com slash chainlist, or you can just get the information yourself through other means if you prefer. So we're gonna search for Sepolia. And you can see here are all the L2 Sepolias, but the one we're interested in is this L1 Sepolia here. So let's go ahead and click on this. This will take us to thirdweb.com slash Sepolia. You can probably just go there directly if you want, but here is the chain ID. So let's go ahead and copy paste this into our VS code. So you can see L1 chain ID. Let's replace it with the Sepolia chain ID. Hello, it's me from the future. Later on in the video, you're gonna see me run into an issue where 
I've edited the, the part out of the video. Essentially, you're not going to run into the same issue that I do because I've come back and edited this part. So what I run into later is I get my RPC rate limited as I try to deploy it. So I was using a public RPC. So that's why you'll see me use Alchemy as my RPC provider because of two reasons. We A, need a dedicated RPC that we're not going to get rate limited on. And B, we need to allow certain kinds of transactions to go through our RPC and Alchemy allows these kinds of transactions to go through. So that's why in the next step, you'll see me sign up for Alchemy to get our own dedicated RPC because later on in the video, you'll see me run into a 429 issue where I'm getting rate limited and our deployment is unsuccessful. So from the future, I've come back to edit this part of the video to say, okay, let's sign up for a dedicated RPC upfront because if you don't, you'll likely run into the same issues that I have. So back to present Jared and enjoy the rest of the video. All right, thank you, Jared from the future for that heads up. So to avoid the issues that I run into quickly later in the video, what I do now is I'm going to create a new Alchemy RPC. And Alchemy allows us to very quickly instantiate a cross-chain RPC. So I'm just gonna to go to the Alchemy dashboard, set up the name here. So let's just do Kurtosis Demo 2.0, just because I already went through this process, create the application, and that's pretty much it. All we need to do is head over to the Networks tab. And you can see here we have Ethereum. So uh, instead of Mainnet, we're gonna swap this to Sepolia. So we'll first select Sepolia HTTPS. We'll copy this value here, swap back over to our VS code. And in place of L1 RPC URL, you can see here I made the mistake of using a public RPC. Let's replace whatever value exists there with the URL from Alchemy. We're gonna do the exact same process for WebSockets. So we'll swap to Sepolia WebSockets and copy this URL as well. Then we're gonna replace whatever value is here for L1 US URL, WebSockets URL, with the URL from Alchemy. So now we have changed the L1 chain ID. We've changed the mnemonic. We need to change the funding amount from 100 ETH to five Ether. So this is how much ETH we're essentially sending to the other accounts like the sequencer and the aggregator. So change it from the default, I think it was 100 to five. And then what we really care about is changing the RPC URL with the values from Alchemy. So getting a dedicated RPC is just going to help us when it comes to actually running through the main function later on in the video. All right, so now we have all of our accounts set up and we have the L1 information set up. What I would recommend is also modifying some of the information about the node config. So if you open up node config.toml inside of the templates folder here, so you can see templates, trusted node and node config.toml, you can find a lot more of the configuration options. Now I would recommend leaving most of this alone unless you really know what you're doing, but you can see here we have even more options to check out of how things like the sequencer are going to behave and the different options available for you to customize here. Now, since the default behavior is deploying to a local L1, a lot of these are very fast. So it's going to do things like post batches back to the L1 very quickly. Whereas since we're in a testnet environment and we have limited funds available, we might want to slow things down. The first one that is recommended to change in a testnet environment is this batch max delta timestamp which as you can see, determines the max amount of time that a batch will be held open, assuming it's not empty. So instead of five seconds, let's go ahead and change this to two minutes. The next one I would recommend changing is last batch virtualization time max wait period, which as you can see, again, defines the max amount of time that we'll allow to pass before virtualizing. For example, if we have sequences to send and it's been more than five seconds by default, since the last time we sent a sequence of batches, then we will go ahead and send that next sequence. So as you can see, five seconds is very fast to be sending uh, the next sequence. So we're gonna go ahead and change this to around 15 minutes. So what this effectively does is instead of sending new batches to L1 every five seconds, which is pretty excessive, we'll send them every 15 minutes, which is a more realistic when we're not in a local environment. One more thing you might wanna customize, and you can, again, feel free to customize the information that you want to change in regards to the sequence sender, the sequencer, and things like this. 
one more thing I would recommend is changing max batches for L1, which is used to configure the maximum number of batches for a single sequence. So how many batches are actually going into a sequence? We're going to opt this from 10 to 15, just so that we can jam more batches of transactions into a sequence or a, a transaction that gets sent to the L1 smart contracts. So we've configured everything available for our Sepolia deployment now, or whatever testnet you chose to deploy to. One final thing we need to do is fund this pre-allocated account here before we actually kick off the deployment process. So we're nearly ready to actually send this and see what happens. So hopefully you're excited. And what we need to do is just provide this account with some funds so that it can send it to these other accounts ready to actually do their jobs, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up well, we're just gonna initiate a transaction to send some testnet funds to the account here. And if you remember this floor example deposit in this case was this command that we ran, which was cast wallet new mnemonic. And this is the account zero that is associated with that mnemonic. So basically we're gonna send this address here, OXE 11A, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna send that the testnet funds from the wallet that we mind the testnet ETH to. Maybe uh, you mined it to your main wallet, which is what I did in, in my case. I'm gonna send testnet funds from my main wallet to this account here. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste this account. And here you can see I have 88 Sepolia ETH in this account. Again, please be extremely careful what network you're on. You don't wanna send real money. You should not be on the mainnet environment. You should be on a test network. You should be on Sepolia, okay? So please, please be careful. If you send funds to these accounts, you might not be able to get them back. So just be careful. You're not sending any real money. Just do a test transaction if that makes you feel more comfortable to make sure you're not losing money. I wish I had this many ETH on my mainnet account, but what I'm gonna do is go ahead and send these to this account here the public key. Paste that wallet address in. Uh, let's do a quick little test transaction. So we'll do 0 0.0001, whatever you're comfortable with. Go ahead and send that transaction across. You can see I'm definitely on Sepolia. I'm on a test net. I'm not sending real money. And we'll go ahead and confirm this transaction here. You can see that is gonna go through a pending state. And once it is received, I'll show you how you can import your development wallet to actually check the funds are available there too. Great, all right, so that transaction is confirmed now. So if we open up this wallet address using either the seed phrase or this private key here, this should have received our testnet funds. All right, so I've swapped over to a different browser profile. This has nothing to do with my main wallet. This is a completely separate MetaMask account. There is no real funds. As you can see, I'm on Ethereum mainnet. None of these accounts have any real money except for, for some reason this one has one cent, it looks like someone's accidentally sent some money and that's what happens, right? If you send real money to these accounts, they will be drained, all right? So do not ever send real money, okay? So swap on over to the Sepolia testnet. And what we're gonna do is since this is just a random account, what we're gonna do is we're going to import a wallet. So import an account. So we can copy and paste the private key this time and paste that private key in import it and you can see here is the 0.0001 ETH that I received from my main account. All right, so there is no real money again in this account. This is the development account that we're going to be using. So now you've kind of confirmed, okay, this is on Sepolia. I haven't sent any real money. It has actually received the funds. Let's actually go ahead and send the remaining 25 or however many ETH that you farmed from those proof of work faucets. Let's send them over to our account now. We've confirmed it with this simple test transaction here. So again, from my main wallet, I'm gonna paste the development wallet address in here, ensure I'm on Sepolia and not any mainnet environment. And I'll go ahead and send around 25 Sepolia ETH here. So let's just give it a little bit more. So let's do 25.1 maybe to cover some gas fees and things like this, just to be safe. Again, 25 is kind of arbitrary, but the account does transfer funds to the different other accounts like the sequencer and the aggregator for those accounts to be able to pay for the gas fees. So let's go ahead and send this 25 Sepolia ETH to the development account that we created using the CLI here. That transaction is confirmed and we can see that inside of our separate wallet, separate Chrome profile, separate 
instance of MetaMask. We now have 25 ETH in our development account and we are ready to send it, right? We're ready to actually run this command that instantiates all of the containers and kicks off all of the L1 deployments, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go ahead and actually launch the Kurtosis CLI now. So here is the Kurtosis documentation of the run command, okay? So Kurtosis run, you can see we're going to pass in a Starlock file. And what we're also going to do is pass in a couple of arguments here. So hopefully the arguments are listed out here. They are, so the first one we're gonna pass is the enclave flag. So in Kurtosis, and you can read the documentation yourself if you're curious, but there is this concept of an enclave or an enclave. I actually don't know the correct pronunciation, but it is an isolated environment for your containers to spin up in. So essentially it's like, like a box for all of your containers to live in. And you can just nuke that box and delete all of the instances or containers running that are related to that enclave, which I'll show you how to do later on in the video as well. There should also be a image download flag as well. So do you wanna download fresh Docker images each time you run this command or maybe you have some cached? Assuming you've never run this command before, we are not going to have any cache, so we don't need to worry about that too much. And there's one more flag that I want to tell you about, which is this args file command. So this is what I've been kind of yapping on about of, well, this params.yml file tells the main file how to behave. So we're gonna pass this as the args file, the params.yml file that we've been configuring to tell the Kurtosis run command, here's all of the arguments and parameters that I want for you to define that behavior of the main main.star file. So those are the, the flags that we're gonna provide. Before we run the run command, we're gonna run a clean. So again, this pretty much just nukes any of the existing ketosis images and stops any existing running enclaves. I strongly suggest just running this before you run the run command, just to make sure you have a clean slate everything's going to run as expected, which I'll show you in the terminal setup that we're going to do next. Anyway, this just is showing you how you can read the documentation of all the commands that we're actually going to run in the next steps as well, okay? All right, so the moment of truth, let's swap over to our terminal scene here. And as I suggested, first we're going to run ketosis clean dash dash all. So this is basically just going to say, all right, if you have any existing enclaves running, we're going to delete them and set up a clean slate for us to run. But just to be aware that is going to delete any existing ketosis related containers running in enclaves and pretty much delete any previous work that you've done with ketosis, all right? So just be careful running that. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to run ketosis run and we'll create a new enclave. We'll call this CDK V1. So this is basically going to spin up a box for our containers to live inside called CDK V1. We'll then pass the dash dash args dash file argument. And as I suggested, we're going to provide the params.yml file, which is the file that we've been modifying throughout this tutorial. And then just to be safe, we're gonna dash dash image download always. So this is just gonna say, give us some fresh image, uh, Docker images to download them every time. Don't read anything from the cache. And then the final, Piece of the puzzle is space dot. And hopefully I can fit this on one screen for you and move it over just so you can see. There we go. The terminal scene just fits it, but that is the magic command. Okay, so Kurtosis run enclave CDK dash V1. So this is the name of our enclave. This is the arguments that we're going to provide, which are stored in params.yml. And then you don't have to do this image download always, but I suggest it just to get the most up-to-date Docker images. And then the final piece of the puzzle is to run it in this current directory. So that is space dot. So dot suggests the current directory, which is Kurtosis CDK, all right? So here is the moment of truth. Let's go ahead and run this Kurtosis run command now. And I encourage you also to read through how Kurtosis actually kind of does a, a couple of steps before running through that actual run function that we've been inspecting and modifying throughout this process. It's gonna go ahead, create the enclave and actually try and compile each of the steps before executing them. So as you can see, it didn't work. So let's go ahead and try and debug what's going on here. So depending on when you're watching the video, you might run into different types of issues or, or different errors that hopefully through these unplanned issues that I run into in this video, 
you'll get a process, I'll get an understanding of the process to try and debug each of these issues. So if I turn my face off for a little bit here, you can see in this bottom line, it's saying at the CDK bridge infrastructure star file, line 133, it is erroring out trying to get the service. So if I welcome myself back to the scene here, what we can do is jump over to the VS code and we saw that it was CDK bridge infrastructure dot star. So this is this file. And then we saw that it was line 133. So this is the line causing some issues. So the first step that I took to try and figure out what was going on here was I said, okay, I wonder if anyone else has this issue. And turns out they did. So I went to the Polygon Kurtosis CDK repository, went into the issues tab here. And the first one was actually the exact same issue. So they've reached this line 133 and they're mentioning, hey, I changed the L1 information, but it is not using the L1 information, I guess, or it's, it's running it into an issue here. And then what I did was I searched this in the file search here. So el one get Lighthouse, that's a mouthful. And if you scroll down, it actually has documentation to say, hey, if you changed the L1 information here, you can see on the right hand side, it says, hey, you actually need to comment out this stuff below. So that's super helpful for this particular issue. So let's go ahead and comment out these three lines inside CDK bridge infra. Let's go to that file. So this looks like L1 RPC service. We can safely comment that out. So let's comment this file out and then L1 RPC IP. So that is this line here. Sorry, I'm blocking the right hand side, but L1 RPC IP. So let's comment this out on the left. So line 150, line 133. And then the final piece was L1 RPC port. So let's go ahead and copy a comment out line 151 on the left hand side here. So that should help us get past this particular issue. Beneath this, you can also see we need to comment some stuff out in the Haproxy CFG file. So I'll just open this. So this is also inside of the templates, Haproxy CFG. And if we search for URL L1 RPC, we should see this on line 24. So I'll close this off on the side here. So line 24, we wanna comment this part out and the use backend underscore backend L1 RPC. So let's comment this part out as well. And then the third thing we wanna come out is backend, backend L1 RPC error. So it looks like we wanna comment out these three lines as well. So line 24, line 29 and 35 through 37. And we should be good to go on our support L1 deployment. So once we've gone ahead and saved that file, the pattern or the process that we're gonna run through is we'll make a change trying to address the error and, and fix the problem. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna run ketosis run clean. Oh, sorry, ketosis clean dash dash all. There's no run required there, just ketosis clean. As you can see, it's going to remove our existing enclave. So it's just gonna give us a clean slate to rerun the same command. So I'm just gonna click up a couple of times and we have the same command that we ran previously. So ketosis run with the params and in the current directory. So let's go ahead and rerun this. And hopefully we have fixed the previous error. So as you can see, again, it is going to try and uh, compile and validate the plan. It looks like we have a new error here, which is good and bad news. Good news is we fixed the previous issue, but bad news is we have a new issue. Here you can see, generally I try and go right down to the bottom line of the error message. You can see, it looks like we are trying to download the Aglaya Rust image. So Polygon Aglaya and looks like it was denied. So here you can see, if you just search the name of the image that's failing, which is what I did in the VS code here, you can see it comes up in params.yml and the Aglaya image is being set to this value here, which for whatever reason, at the current point in time I'm recording, I'm not able to download this image. So what I'm going to do instead is uncomment out the line above it and comment out this line. So we're basically swapping the image to use from this Aglaya RS 0.1.0 to the Aglaya from the OX Polygon repository or owner, I guess, to 0.1.3. So basically just swapping around what image we're going to use and hopefully this will work for us. Let's do a clean. So we run ketosis clean all, and then we can just rerun the 
run command once again. So it's going to go through the same process. Like I said, hopefully this gives you an idea of how you can kind of debug any issues that you run into. Just have a look around the repository, search for the key points of the error message, clean it up and try rerun it again. So you can see here, it seems to be progressing. So what it's done is it has created an enclave for us. You can see it's skipping the deployment of an, a local L1. It's gonna go ahead and start deploying the ZK AVM contracts on the L1. And now the execution is in progress. So deploying ZK AVM contracts on L1, and here we go. So the process is starting. And typically this does take around 10, 15 minutes on a local deployment. So probably around the same amount of time on Sepolia, maybe a little bit slower in, an, in a testnet environment, but let's go ahead and grab a drink and we'll come back when this either succeeds or errors out. A few moments later. As you can see, we've got our cup of tea as this runs in the background here. I can see a lot of contract deployments and it doesn't seem to have given us any red error messages. So after that step, you can see it pretty much progresses in chronological or like sequential order, goes through each of the steps, right? So you can see once it finished off the deployment of the uh, smart contracts to the L1, it continues to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. And now we are starting the rest of the ZK EVM node components. And as I was just thinking it was going so well, we get a bunch of red error messages. So let's go ahead and see what succeeded and what didn't succeed before we try and debug this. So as you saw, future Jared came back to fix the rate limiting issue so you don't run into the same thing that I do. So hopefully you won't actually have encountered that issue that I just did. So what I do next is I refund my test account and I clean it up and rerun and go through the exact same process with my Alchemy RPC instead of the free public one. So I have just cleaned everything back up and fixed my RPC, which hopefully you don't have to do thanks to future Jared, but I'm just going to rerun it again and it will go through the exact same steps. And hopefully this time we won't get rate limited and our deployment will be successful. So I'll let this run through to the end and then we'll move on to the part of the video where we actually kind of explore once we've deployed everything, what's actually going on and how can we play around with the different components and containers that are actually running uh, once this process is complete. Amazing. So now all of this has been set up. We've instantiated all of the pieces of the puzzle for our L2 to actually operate. So you can see all of these different components in a running state in the right hand column here. You can see we have things like the contracts were successfully deployed. We have the bridge service running. We have the aggregator running. We have the RPC running, we have the sequencer running, we have the prover running, all of the pieces of the puzzle that we talked about in the kind of conceptual overview section of this video running inside of Docker containers. And if we swap over to our Docker scene, you can see in here, these are all of the components that we've instantiated inside of Docker containers. So you can see we have the aggregator, we have the sequencer, we have the bridge UI. So each of these components are running locally inside of your Docker engine. And what you can do is using the Kurtosis CLI is you can kind of play around or tap into each of these services. So what I'm gonna show you next is how you can actually utilize Kurtosis now that we've set up all of these different pieces of the puzzle, how can we actually see what's going on under the hood and start to test out the L2 by sending our first transactions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna clear this completely. And what we can do to bring all of that back up is run Kurtosis Enclave Inspect and provide the name of the enclave that we want to take a look at. So. For me, that was CDKV1, which was uh, the name that we provided when we ran the Kurtosis run command. So when we run this, you can see, okay, that brings up all of the different components again, and all of the different pieces that we can kind of access. So for example, inside of contracts 001, what we can do using Kurtosis is we can actually shell into that particular service. So what we can do is we can run Kurtosis service shell and give the name of the enclave, so CDKV1, and then the name of the service that you wanna shell into. So for us, that's contracts 001. 
And as you can see, we are now tapped into that container. So what we can do is let's just clean this up. We can take a look or what do we have here? All right, so we have a couple of different files. What do we wanna take a look at? Let's take a look at the ZK EVM folder. What do we have in here? All right, we have a couple of different helpful pieces of information. So we have this combined.json file. So what we can do is say combined, uh, let's just print that file out using cat. And as you can see, there is some useful information. If I move my head out of the way here, you can see here is some of the contract addresses for each of the pieces that we deployed. So for example, we have the verifier address, we have the rollup address, we have the sequencer address, we have the batch data on the first uh, batch of transactions that was posted, we have the data availability contract address, we have the aggregator address, we have the admin address, we have all of this information. So this is super helpful, this particular file, which is why I chose this one to show you. What we can do with this information is let's take a look at, for example, the sequencer. So let's open up our Sepolia scan here. So I'm just gonna open this up in the browser. And what we can do is I just copy and pasted the sequencer address, which I grabbed from here. So OX79D7. And on Sepolia scan, we can actually just go ahead and take a look. And this is what's awesome about deploying to Sepolia is that you can see on Sepolia, on an actual Ethereum test net, this is sequencing batches and posting them to the rollup, or I guess in this case, the Validium smart contract that we deployed on uh, Sepolia. So for example, 13 minutes ago, you can, you can tell this because we set it to be every 15 minutes, post a new batch, right? Post a new sequence of batches rather to the L1 smart contract. So in two minutes time, it'll post a new sequence of batches to the L1 smart contract. And if we take a look at this transaction hash, you can see it's coming from our sequencer and it's sending it to this contract here. But this is sequencing the batches and sending them to the L1 smart contract on Sepolia. And you can see, it's calling sequence batches Validium. So in our case, we deployed a Validium. This is exactly what we were talking about from a production standpoint. Now we've gone ahead and actually customized it and deployed it to Sepolia. So that is the sequencer going to this contract here. And what we should be able to see is inside of that terminal, we also have things like the verifier address or the aggregator. So let's take a look at the aggregator here. We've got OX9, uh, paste that into Sepolia scan. And what do we have within here? I guess currently there, since we haven't actually sent any transactions, there's no proofs being posted because there's no batches to actually prove. So that's why we're not seeing anything here. But once we go ahead and show you how to submit transactions to the L2, you can see at least the transferring process was successful here. This aggregator has 10 ETH at its disposal to spend on verifying our batches of transactions. So once we're ready to get out of this container, we can just type exit and that will take us back to our local machine. And then we could do Ketosis Service Enclave Inspect, I think it was, Ketosis Enclave Inspect CDK V1. And we can take a look at all of the different services available to us. So what I wanna show you next is how you can actually submit transactions to the L2 via the RPC service that is available to us here. So just to kind of explain what we're actually looking at, because we have a bunch of different ports, a bunch of different numbers. What are we actually looking at here? So just to give you an example, let's take a look at the RPC's HTTP RPC URL. And the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna do ketosis port print, and we'll type the name of the enclave, which is CDK-V1. And then what we're interested in is this service. So we'll paste that ZK EVM node RPC 001. And what we're interested in specifically in that service is the HTTP RPC, which is here. So let's grab that out of the RPC. And you can see that is gonna print out our actual RPC URL for the L2. Now using the cast command, we can actually send example test transactions to this URL here or the HTTP RPC for the L2 here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to export the variable called eth underscore RPC URL and set it to be open string dollar sign, open bracket and the command that we just ran. So ketosis port print, print out that, 
We actually don't even need to do this because we already did the next step. What you can do instead is just print out this value. So let's quickly clean things up. Let's print out this and we'll copy that value. And what we're gonna do is export eth underscore RPC underscore URL equals this value here. So open string, close string and paste the RPC URL of the L2 here. So now if we do a eth underscore RPC URL with a dollar sign in front maybe, all right, not, not perfect, but as you can see, it's, it actually prints it out. Maybe if we do cat, print that variable out. All right, whatever, it, it is saved. I just don't know the correct command to actually print out the variable here. So you can see now inside of this eth RPC URL, we do have our L2 RPC URL saved. And this is just gonna be super helpful for us to use the cast command to actually start sending test transactions to our L2 directly. So for example, the most basic command that we can do is just do cast block number. And you can see we have 1389 as our block height on the L2. So that's a super basic command just to check that everything is actually working and we are creating new blocks. If we run that again, it should be constantly updating to the latest block height. One other little thing we can do is check the balance of an account on the L2. So for example, the admin account here, OX5F, let's go ahead and copy that jump into the terminal and type cast balance dash dash ether paste the public key and you can see here is the balance on the l2 of this account uh, it's 10,000.000 etc etc so these are just little commands to check everything is actually running and what we're going to do now is actually send a simple transaction so to do that we're again going to grab the private key of the admin account since it just has some funds available for us to use and we're going to copy this private key value. And I'm gonna jump into the terminal once again. And we're going to use cast send dash dash legacy dash dash value. And we'll just send 0 0.01 ether to keep it simple. We'll send it to the burn address. And the burn address, it doesn't have to be the burn address, but it's just the most easy for me to send it to that address. And then what we're gonna do is pass the dash private key flag or dash dash private key. And then we're gonna grab the private key that we just copy pasted into this argument here. So what we're gonna do is send 0 0.01 ether to the burn address. So we're essentially deleting 0 0.01 eth onto our L2 here. Let's go ahead and send that transaction. You can see it is confirmed extremely quickly. And we have the transaction hash on the L2 here for us to take a look at. To make things a bit more exciting, we can also use the poly CLI to load test the chain, which means pretty much just spamming transactions to the L2 and seeing how it performs. So what we can do is we'll just grab the command from poly CLI. So if we do poly CLI help, you can see here all of the available commands and one of them is load test. So you can run a generic load test against an EVM style JSON RPC endpoint, which we have. So what we can do is poly CLI load test help. And you can see here are all the flags and that didn't print too nicely. So I'll just zoom out for us and you can see there is a bunch of different examples. So uh, here we go, we can see, we can change uh, the verbosity, the verb I have no idea how to say that word, verbosity, I'm gonna say, of the output. We can change how many requests, we can change the rate limit, we can change the RPC URL, et cetera, et cetera. So here is a ton of different options for you to do. What I'm gonna do is just go ahead and copy this existing command that I have and zoom in for us once more. So here we have poly CLI load tests, dash dash RPC URL, and we're gonna provide the ETH RPC URL that we had stored as a variable. We'll do dash dash legacy verbosity of 700. The amount of transactions that we're going to send is 500 with a rate limit of five. Mode T refers to transfer transactions, I believe. And the private key that we're going to send it from is not this, it is the admin accounts private key that we just used to initiate that first test transaction. So we'll go ahead and grab that again from my params.yml file here, which is this one on line 103. And then if we submit this, should see test transaction one, two, three, four, five, and we're going to send 500. And it is essentially just going to spam the L2 RPC 
I mean, this is not a, a huge load test, right? We're doing 500 with a, a rate limit of, I believe it was five per second. So it's not gonna be too heavy of a lift of the L2 to handle this, but it just goes to show, okay, here's what the L2 is capable of handling. And it'll allow us to actually see all of these transactions being included as part of the batch and get sequenced and hopefully on the L1 actually get verified as well by our aggregator. And there we go, you can see as soon as all of the transactions have been finalized, we get a nice little review of what happened here. I think we get the TPS somewhere. So that was handling 4.7 per second, which makes sense because we were doing five per second, I'm pretty sure with our rate limit. So as expected with a couple of seconds in between starting and finalizing, we have successfully handled the load test on the L2. To check the progress of the transaction finality from L2 to L1, you can do simple things like cast RPC ZK EVM underscore batch number. And that is the latest batch number on the L2 that has been created. We can then do cast RPC ZK EVM virtual batch number. This is how many batches have reached the virtual state, which is meaning they've been sequenced and sent to the L1. We could also do cast RPC ZK EVM verified batch number which is how many of the batches have associated zero knowledge proofs that verify their validity on the L1. Something we can also do out of the box is check out the observability stack. So you can see at the top here, we have Grafana, Panoptichain. And if you open these up, for example, if you open this 63885 port, this will take you to this Grafana dashboard page. And I will open that up for you. And if you navigate in this little burger menu at the top left here, go to dashboards, general panopto chain. And what you can do here is actually open up some of these sections here, like blocks, transactions, batches, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see transactions, for example, since we did our big load test of around 500 transactions, you can see that block kind of spiked up to 400 transactions within that block and then 87 transactions within a block, and then blocks in between since there's obviously no transactions being submitted, have no transactions within those blocks. You get a nice visualization of everything that's happening. You can see a transaction value, transaction gas price, transaction cost, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can actually see the progress of your transactions from L one, sorry, L2 to L1. So you can see here's how many batches have been sequenced. Here's how many batches have been verified and the time since each of the last batches were sequenced and verified. You can see information about the bridge, things like global exit route, time since last rollup exit route, et cetera, et cetera. In regards to the ZK AVM, you can see how many users and how much value has actually been bridged across to your L2. In this case, we haven't bridged anything. So obviously that is going to be zero currently. So this is really cool because you can also do things like filter this to information about the L1 or only about the L2. So for example, if I deselect L1, here is the current block height of the L2. Whoops, and then what we can do is see purely information about the L2 as well. So you can do cool things like filter things out, change around what you wanna see in each of these dashboards. But I just love this because it shows you, you know, all of the information about your L2 chain, such as how many people have bridged across, how much value has been bridged across, things like how many transactions are being fitted into each block over time. I just think this is super cool to see like how your L2 chain is performing and you get all of this out of the box. So I think it's super awesome and definitely worthwhile checking out. One really cool thing to check out as well is actually within the Docker containers section. So for example, one interesting one I like to look at is the node sequence sender. So this is a part of the sequencer and is just purely responsible for sending the sequences. So usually it'll just say, since we set it to 15 minutes between sequences, it'll just say not enough time has elapsed. But if we scroll up fast, far enough, we should see here, we can see sending sequences now, sending request to sign the sequence, receive the signature, waiting for it to get confirmed, waiting, waiting for it to get confirmed. And then the sequence is finally sent and it goes back into that polling state to see, okay, is it ready to receive the next sequence of batches? 
So I think that's a pretty cool one to check out. You can pretty much browse any of these, right? So you can browse through, for example, let's take a look at the RPC. So the RPC should be what's processing transactions. And let's say if we did another load test, let's go ahead and pop that in the background. You can see the transactions are flooding and flooding through into the sequencer, RPC rather, and you can see information about each of the transactions. So transaction gas price, all of the information like the transaction ID, the L1 gas price, the L2 gas price. And these are just flooding through since I did another load test in the background here. You can see as well in the Panopticain dashboard, this should start to be popping off as well. So what we should see, if we give this a quick little refresh, what we should see is the transactions start to flood through, the blocks start to get filled with those, batch, those batches and the transactions per block start to increase. So it might take a little while. You can see here the base gas fee is starting to increase within the past one minute since we are sending more and more transactions within the past one minute. What we should see is transactions per block start to increase. And we should also see later on in maybe 15 minutes, the number of sequences go up and the number of verified batches go up as well. So it's pretty cool. You can see in real time as you start to do things like load tests, you can actually see in both the Docker containers, the logs start to flood through in real time and within the dashboards that you have in the observability stack start to represent that information in real time as well. So for example, you can see our load test is complete now. And if we go back to take a look at our dashboards, this transactions per block, when we started the test around three minutes ago, you can see it starts to spike up and up and up. Transactions per block reaches around 15. And now our load test is complete. There you go, it goes straight back down to zero. So I just find this so awesome to look at that you can literally spam your L2 that you just created in real time, see these dashboards represent both things like the gas, you know, how much gas is being used on your chain. I think that's so cool. You can send so many transactions, view how the chain reacts in real time, see things like the effect it has on gas, on how many transactions are being fit into each block. And then later on, you can even track the batches back down to the L1 as well and see how long it is taking, how your configuration affects, how the batches get sent back down to the L1 and watch those batches get verified in real time too. So I don't know, I'm kind of nerding out, but I just think this is so awesome to see. And all of this comes out of the box. You know, you don't have to configure anything special to get this working all of these pieces of the puzzle to make a awesome L2 come with the configuration that we set up. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it and progressing through it as much as I did making it. Reminder, if you got stuck throughout the process, there'll be a link to the Discord in the description below. With that said, thank you very much for watching. If you got value out of this, it helps me out in this wonderful world of algorithms that we live in. If you leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel so we can show this video to more builders like yourself. Much appreciated and we'll see you in the next one.